So, Mark, you said you wanted to talk about how moving things from session to type context went. That seems like a good thing. We could also look at some of this at, like if we have extra time, we could look at some of this stuff in session. Um, yeah, uh, there was, and I also want to take a look if we have time at uh, Santiago's sort of brief overlook of the sync module and data structures as sort of a overview of what we have and maybe if we sort of already see patterns to think about maybe we can okay. spot off work to have someone add uh, more to that. Uh, I did not type up any docs onto how the session moves went, but I can sort of give a brief overview. Um, so the idea is that we have a lot of stuff in session that's sort of not immutable yet, but will become so uh, once we either do like peer lowering or some other sort of pre stage of sort of early compilation. Um, and the idea is that sort of CY context right now is our post peer lowering and maybe some other stuff, uh, global context, which has a bunch of sort of easy ways of putting stuff in it and then sort of it can be immutable from then on. Um, so I think that went pretty well in general. Uh, one concern was that as we move queries back, we may see sort of problems where like before we remove the lock and now we have to sort of re-add the lock if queries are far enough back that two by context sort of becomes earlier. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you're saying like you made you made this change. I don't know if other people sort of knew about it, but where we took the lint store out of session, you initialize it kind of on the stack as part of registration basically, and then move it into the type context if in a frozen frozen state. So we don't need any locks at the end of the day. Um, I don't think we needed any locks, right? Everything was single threaded when it's being yeah. You know. And uh I think what would happen if we moved, like in that case, if we move the type context, or let's call it the query barrier or something, if we move the query barrier back so that it, I think your concern is if we moved it sufficiently far back that it uh, would overlap the place where the lint store is mutable. Like maybe we move it all the way back. So the first thing we do is make queries and that's all our global state. Mm -hmm. I think what we would do in that case is we would want to have a query for registering plugins or something that like builds the lint store and returns it in frozen state. That would be the ideal case so that mm -hmm. the we don't need a lock because we sort of move that into the query mechanism itself managing the lock. Um, that seems like it'll work for things that have a clear initialization period maybe less well for if there's state that's kind of mutated on and off throughout like the crate store or something um, kind of lazily handled throughout execution. But probably what happens there is that those things should be lifted up into queries as much as possible. Because uh, that is sort of the mechanism we have for that. Right. That, that makes sense. Um, I think that was all I had in terms of thoughts on that um, I don't know if others have more thoughts or questions. This was also what Zoxy was imagining when I just described. Mm -hmm. yeah, says. Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions, but I did review the PR. Um, anyway, I think the answer is, will this be a problem? Should probably be, well, let's wait and see. It's better now. So yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. If we were gonna look at the sync module review, Um, 
who wants to lead this? Santiago, do you want to walk through this? this so what uh, this is, is like a, uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I was going to say that, I mean, it, it's basically, basically there are a lot of basic constructions there. Like you probably know all this, but, uh, um, and when you have parallel compiler set as false, there are a lot of things that are defined in some way and where you have that that's true is defined in another different way, which is, uh, more parallel oriented setup and uh, but yeah our basic constructions I guess the, the, the most interesting thing to to figure out with this is the usages of these things and if they are correct or not this is more or less what we did with with Nico on, on Raspberry Rust like quickly but uh, I mean other than that I don't know if there is a lot of things to really to pay attention on this unless I'm forgetting or speak, skipping something important So one thing I wanted to talk about is, for example, the like atomic abstraction in this module seems a bit like, weird, at least to me. Um, and, and some of the other abstractions seem like maybe we should try to either delete them or remove them, um, particularly like around the multi-threaded lock or however you decipher the empty prefix uh, and multi-threaded ref. Um, just because they're sort of weird primitives and it seems better to define them sort of as you need them versus having this global thing. Uh, it seems yep. that's sort of clear to me. Some of this I think arises because of uh, need to switch between single and parallel compilation. Um, but maybe it's worth like looking them over. So, well, so there's atomic and atomic cell. Uh, you mentioned that one specifically, right? Yeah, um, so, so it seems like in almost all cases, if you have a parallel or non-parallel compiler, you can just, just use atomics directly. Like it won't matter in the sense that even if you're single-threaded, atomics have essentially zero overhead. So it feels like we should just make the leap and just use them versus having this abstraction and sort of splitting code and making things more complicated as a result. Mm, there is some advantages. Like I'd rather we just use, we could also consider using crossbeams atomic, which is good. Uh, I don't know if that's what we're actually doing here in parallel mode. There, there are some advantages though, like if you have a new typed integer, for example, which we do a lot for indices and so on, then being able to use like crossbeams atomic Atomic T instead of say atomic U size is, is a big win. Um, I don't know sure. if we actually do that, but yeah, my understanding is that these are like the atomic primitive itself is not re-exported, so I'd be fine with like re-exporting and just saying use crossbeam atomic or whatever the equivalent is everywhere. Um, yeah. It just feels weird to have sort of types that are sometimes atomic and sometimes not, and especially around like the documented, I believe, like the idea of, well, we have this atomic, but don't actually export it. Always go with uh, the like re-exported atomics instantiated for all the like integer types. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it also seems like we can start to move in small ways to erase the difference between sequential and parallel. Yeah, that, that, that was the other thing that I was going to suggest that we sort of be less eager to be sort of single threadedly perfect and just like use locks directly instead of trying to be efficient and not use them for non performance critical areas. So lock is essentially free as I understand it. If you're on a single threaded machine, it's like there is a cost, but it's not it's too significant. Yeah, it depends. Like it wouldn't work for like the query system, but for, I don't know, like crate store probably doesn't matter. It'd be right, so another example might be LRs. Well, let's go through an order. What is parallel? So parallel iterator and catch panics. This is like, I guess this is the 
<laughs> the code that does parallel iteration. Um, more or less. Uh, so this is that parallel macro that does different work in parallel and then sometimes does a parallel iterator. Okay. What is the catch panics part of this story? For the single thread case, oh. parallel is defined such that it catches panics in each block, which is okay. intended to have sort of the same I behavior see. if you're single threaded or multi threaded. Okay. Well, we probably want to keep this at least unless we uh, change the mechanism as we discussed to something more limited. But LRC might be an example where maybe we could just switch to ARC, call it a day, see what happens. We could at least test the performance results, be interesting. Yeah, one of the sort of reasons why I would like to explore switching over is that a lot of the time, like I feel like new contributors, especially if they see this LRC thing, they're like, what is this? Especially because the L prefix sort of feels, some, I, I constantly think it's a lock and then I go and I'm like, oh wait, no, this is not a lock. Yeah, I never did even occur to me that L, or L might stand for lock. I've never had any idea what L would stand for. <laughs> so it was like, it's the other RC. <laughs> It's like opposite in the keyboard from A, but as far away as you can get. <laughs> yeah, I think it's worth trying. I do agree it's confusing. Um, not to mention that, well, I guess that won't help. I get annoyed that if you don't build with parallel compilation enabled and you use RC, things work until until you hit CI, but that's just gonna be true regardless. No. Uh, weak, what is weak? This is like, this is probably related to LRC. Yeah, it's the same story of- Yeah, being... so we can just not have that if we don't have LRC. Mm -hmm. And then there's guards. So these are like locks, basically, related to the lock mechanism. Yeah, they seem uninteresting for the most part. The guards themselves are not interesting. The question is whether we could switch to locks unilaterally or whether we want ref cell and what the performance impact would be, right? Mm -hmm. One presumably, thing that, go on. Presumably like the overhead of just switching to locks uh, is too high, but could. Probably, we could probably get rid of, so MT lock is an interesting special case uh, because it's not a ref cell. It's like when it's not, when you're in sequential mode, it's just an ampersand mute T essentially, or an owned T. And it becomes so it doesn't translate to ref cell directly. Uh, it seems like one we could possibly just get rid of and just use lock because the overhead of introducing ref cell rights is probably pretty low. And then we have one less thing. We're not using lock in that many places though. Right, well, there's the query system. Yeah, I think it's less so about like how many places we're using it and more so, at least for me, like which each, one? Time I, each time I hit something like this, it's like, okay, what is going on? It'll be you know, 10, 15 minutes before I can figure out why we have this weird primitive. Yeah. Definitely MT lock took me a little while. And it's another case where what does MT stand for? Like, I guess it's a lock, a multi-threaded lock, but like aren't all locks multi-threaded? I don't know, <laughs> but like, but, yeah. No, I think I understand now, but. Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> Santiago and I went through and look, looked at all the places where locks and atomics are used and kind of enumerated them. And we were, I was a little pleasantly like surprised to see how few of them there were. Um, this probably is missing stuff, but this came from just like rip ripping through the code. Uh, there was a few that caught my eye that we could look at in terms of like further candidates for simplification. Uh, these create, create metadata thing in particular, and of course, session and C store, I think were the big ones. Um, a lot of these other patterns seemed fine. Like the here ID validator has some, it says here, some vector that many threads are pushing into. Um, it's kind of local and relatively easy to understand. Should we look at these a little bit? I think that would make sense to maybe even like assign some work to someone. Um, do you want to look at them together or should we assign it out and have to talk about it next time? Um, I think oh. Yeah, I, I was about to start with, with, with that thing uh, just before the meeting, but uh, if you want to assign to somebody, assign to me. If you want to go over now, it's okay also. Which thing? Do you mean this create metadata thing? Yeah, like I, I was starting to, to, to check out if, uh, like the possibility of, of making at least the fields private. Okay. And, and expose some API for, of the usages of that of, of that thing, something like that. Find where it's defined. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe here. There it is. Yeah. Okay. It looks a little different than when we last looked at it. These all look. These all say create. I feel like the last time we looked, they all said pubs. Maybe somebody already did a pass. I think Petroshenkov recently landed something in this area. Yeah, that's already a win. And I also don't see nearly as many locks. This used to like all be pub and all be lock, as I recall. There's still a few, but. Okay, I remember, yeah, I remember Petroshenkov's PR. Um, well, okay, so do, let's see. So we know that they're not public. <laughs> That's a win. Um, they're still like fairly wide open, even if they're local to the crate. Uh, crate is still a big win. My guess is it won't be trivial to remove these locks, but if we were going to try to do so, they're probably mostly used for lazy, lazily growing or something. Mm, C store itself looks like we thought it was okay. It was mainly the session that has lots and lots of stuff. I'm not sure exactly how much anymore. I don't know, where is it? GitHub, Rust Lane, Rust. So what we could do is like, well, okay, whatever these things are. <laughs> There's lots of locks there. Um, these are all those spans that are collected during parsing or something. I'm just gonna close my eyes and ignore all that. Wait, I think this is the parser as opposed to the REST-C session. And also, I'm not yeah. really sure why this is all locked because I thought the parsing was single-threaded, but I guess I'm wrong. Don't know. You're right though, it's the wrong session. I know, it looked funny. Yeah, well, we could try to figure that out. Why is it all locked? It's probably locked for a reason. But it's maybe because it's embedded in here. Yeah, that would be why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, no, that that shouldn't actually matter, right? Because the 
first sets, we only later embedded in the session, but while we're parsing, I don't think we have a session around, so. Well, I suspect this, the parse session wants it to be like cells and ref cells, and then because it's in session, which must be oh. thrown safe, then it's locked. But there might be a case to be like, put a lock around just this one field as opposed to all little fields. Maybe, I don't know, that's for another time. Yeah. We also do have like a one thread primitive, which should be. Go back to the top. Well, all right. So, buffered lints, you know all about that, Mark. Where are all the yeah. locks? One time diagnostics. I think this is sort of the thing where it might be interesting. Like, useful to talk about because, like, it's the pattern of we have this, it, it's explicitly global state, like, there's no way to de globalify it. And everywhere in the compiler is essentially adding into it by just like calling a method um, or some equivalent of calling a method. Right. It feels like a lot of these things, like, well, like this field, I don't know, it seems okay. I would like it. It seems like it could be encapsulated better. There's no reason. Kind of execution contention though, right? Like if you're flooding this lock, then you're gonna hurt the user anyway. So. You're, you're right. Oh, well, you're assuming that, well, I'm not really too worried about that because I don't think we use this field very often. Like it's just like certain random error messages grab this lock and stick themselves in there so as to, at least in this particular case, uh, so as to avoid being printed more than once or something. Um, yeah, most of the stuff on session, I feel is like kind of similar to that in where it's like, it's not really hot and it's a lot of the time it's kind of just some stuff in the compiler wants to add to this vector or grow this thing. Um, which is kind of not great. Some of this I also seems like it still predates the query system where it's just been sitting around for years at this point. It was kind of, because it used to, I mean, session used to be even more ad hoc than it was now. And so it could be a lot of this stuff could become queries nowadays. Like uh, looking at like that allocator kind and injected pin at running time, like those could definitely become queries in one way or another. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. So I don't think, not the one-time diagnostics probably, but plug in LLVM, these things, probably yes. and. What were the ones you just said? They sounded like, oh yeah, these ones. Yeah, those down there. Also, even the crate types field, like that should be statically known as soon as we create the session. I'm not actually sure why that's filtered or what's going on with the ones there. I mean, it was a ref cell at some point and then turned into a once, but yeah. Right. Once is better than certain things. There's pro I think the, the pattern might be that we make the session as the very first thing and then initialize it in some of these cases. That's where the ones has come from rather than well, the Well, it should, I mean, that makes sense. But I would also, in the, in, I would suspect that if we, if this is a one-time initialization, you have a mutable reference to the session. So you should be able to mutate without locks at that point. Or maybe we haven't thread that kind of like that support might not be threaded through just yet but that would be what i would suspect is one time initialization you have a mutable session otherwise you have a shared reference yeah a lot of these are sort of the like we were we are really quick to put a session inside a arc and then we just can't mutate it after that um okay which so, probably be changed but it's a pretty big factor it seems like we should try first to break out queries where we can that's like step number one, right? And it seems like we identified three candidates so far. These recursion and type length limit could probably be queries. I don't know. I mean, I guess right now what we do is when we see them in the parser or something, we, we write to them, but we could instead uh, just go fetch the attribute from the create limit, from the create right. yeah, the attribute list. I don't think we use them before the query system exists. 
That's the key question. Well, macro expansion uses the recursion limit. It can't use it from here, right? Because it shouldn't have access to session, I imagine. Maybe what? Does. does macro expansion have access to session? I would kind of expect no. I think so. Maybe. Um, I, don't I don't know, but I thought everything has access to the session. Well, we have parse sess and then session. Okay, everything with parser. But maybe that's part, maybe that's included in the parser, yeah. I'm not sure, it's a good question. Um, I may have missed this, but just to know what's going on here, what is this one thread type? It is a primitive that essentially says, when you create me, I believe it saves off like the thread ID, and then you have to access it from that thread and otherwise you'll just get panicked. Okay. And it like derefs to reference the T, I think. Oh, that's this one here. I missed that. I saw you, I heard you say it out loud and I was like, I don't know what that is. But, okay. Yeah, like, interesting, okay. It's kind of goofy, but okay. It seems like definitely the kind of thing that maybe even just removing those and replacing them with locks is a worthwhile win because in a parallel compiler, presumably one thread is like right. that idea. It's definitely a, something we don't want long term. So has global allocator and has panic handler. Oh God. Yeah, those are definitely queries. Like definitely easily. queries. <laughs> I remember adding those and I'm sorry, but those are just definitely queries. <laughs> <laughs> Spans of trait methods that weren't found to avoid emitting. That's probably generated by the parser or something. I suspect this could, this doesn't have to be like, I suspect this could be built up kind of okay that it's there, but I guess that it follows this pattern you were describing, Mark, of like, uh, something that gets mutated during parsing or something. I have to look where it actually gets written. I think it's resolution. Uh, same with the one below it. It's mm, Yeah. If that is the case, then yeah, I would expect that like resolution either has a mutable reference or a like a shared reference that is actually mutable later on. And so like the resolution stuff would produce these things we then use a mutable reference to the session to shove it in there. And then they would be immutable once we start actually doing parallel work afterwards. Well, the resolution also generates big data structures as a result, right? I think. I, sus I, mean, mm -hmm. I suspect so. So I could probably put those in there and then we could right. access them via query that way yeah. instead. It's even point. nicer. Um, is someone taking notes on this, by the way? Yeah, I've, well, okay. kind of. Okay. So it seems like we have plenty now. We, like, what we should do is some people should look at some of these, right? Uh, and my takeaway from this is we can make a lot of progress on sessions. Uh, it's like low hanging fruit. And we should do that. Why not? It's not gonna solve any big problems. But I guess the other thing we could talk about then is last time we talked about, uh, the job server and everything, and we sort of left it without any clear action items and nothing happened. Uh, maybe we want to produce one. The closest thing I remember is that I was looking to look at the Rayon new scheduler to see if it works better, but I didn't do it. I sort of knew I wouldn't do it. So I shouldn't have said I might. <laughs> I missed that discussion, but uh... I, I wonder if you talked about that it's, it's sort of a mismatch to use it, job server for threads rather than processes, I feel like. And, uh, I don't know <laughs> if there's a good resolution for that, but I'm not real comfortable with the way Rayon is acquiring and releasing it every time it sleeps. We didn't talk about it very much, except that I said that like, the newer Rayon scheduler is not so aggressive about starting threads. Right. So it would be sort of wouldn't ramp up so fast, um, but it would still 
be somewhat fine grained. Do you have a thoughts on a better approach? No, that's why I was hoping you talked more about it. Okay. So I think we had mentioned an action item of going in and like disabling the threat acquires and releases and like essentially just flipping out job server entirely. Yeah, you're right. And then just that. running perf on seeing like how a single threat performance and maybe like some of the other benchmarks we have. Obviously, like we can't actually release that, but it will give us insight. So like we've been saying that job server is the source of all evil, um, but whether that's actually true, we don't actually have to. So the idea was to just let it have all the threads at once without bothering job server. Yeah. All I got to do is remove the hooks from the RAN. Uh, right. Yeah, I was even thinking just go into like the job server where we like create it in RSC and just comment out the actual requirements to minimize work. But did we also, um, we talked about, I, I get the sense that I ha we have this suspicion that job server is slowing down Rayon, but we don't really have a precise understanding of what the pattern that Rayon has that's causing it to be so bad. Like we don't know, I, we didn't, I, I think we have some suspicions of like, it's waking up or going to sleep too much, but we don't really have like a picture of like why it's so bad versus like wood switching to just a pure only iterator, like parallel top level thread loop would that be all we need? Like, would that solve the issues? Or would even that have the same job server issues? And so, um, to some sense, I think we can do some measurements of like ripping things out or trying out the uh, new Rayon scheduler, but I suspect that we still also need to just do kind of more investigation as to what exactly is the, like what exactly is the profile for why it's so slow today and why exactly are we acquiring too much and or how could we acquire less? Or like, right. I mean, it kind of goes back to what Josh was saying. I was like, is it even possible to use job server in the compiler reasonably so? Or do we have to have like some even coarser semantics for how we use it? It's not really obvious to me how, if we had, if we sort of re-implemented the way on thread pool, I guess this is sort of your same point, but I'm not sure what it would do so differently at the end of the day. With the writer jobs server. It's going to start up some threads. They're going to try to get tokens. They're going to pull from some central queue, probably. That was like they, maybe they wouldn't work still. They would use a central queue just to be simpler. But like, so what? I don't know. Um, and that's what I want to understand of like, once you start a parallel top level loop, you should like do on the order of number of CPU syscalls to acquire that many tokens. And then you should do nothing job server related until the very end once everything finishes. But it sounds like there's a huge amount of thrashing during that giant parallel loop. And so that might be causing some issues, but I'm um, well, like figuring that out. Do we know that to be true? No, we don't. And I'm just, and so that's like kind of the investigation that I think we need to figure out. Cause like, if the thrashing is happening, that's a very clear bug to fix. If the thrashing is not happening, then like, oh my God, job server might not work at all. And we have to kind of rethink how we're gonna do this. Mm. Cause like, I, I'm kind of under the impression that Rusty has like, I don't know, a small handful, like 20, 30 top level parallel loops, like being optimistic. And then like everything within that should be completely parallelizable. And if you, yeah, so I, anyway, anyway, I, I, don't, I don't want to speculate too, too much, but it's like, I just wanted to point out that like the investigation of what's what exactly is slow here, I feel like hasn't we still need to do at some point. I mean, or unless unless a fix comes down the road. I think even S trace could give you a top level count just to see how many read and write calls it does for the uh, job server file handle. That's true. The tooling that you were showing us, Alex, the graphs uh, that were we, we were showing, like the how a cargo how a cargo execution played out, is that generic enough that it will work with the parallel Rusty and give us some idea of like bursts of parallelism or something like that, or is it requiring more integration? Um, none of the cargo tooling keeps track. The cargo's build graph stuff doesn't keep 
track of threads information. Um, otherwise, it would be the self-profiling self -profiling stuff in Rusty. And I haven't actually run that with multi-threaded mode enabled, so I'm not sure how the self I'm not sure how the self profiler handles multiple threads. I suspect it would look pretty good, but I'm not certain. About it that. should work just fine from what I know about it, and I believe um, Wesley Weiser, who's on that uh, so working group or whatever, is working on sort of seeing if we can actually do that in a sort of multi crate scenario as well to like integrate with the cargo stuff. Okay, so it sounds like the answer is yes for single crate. Yes. And no for multi crates. At this point. Yeah. That'll give us some idea of like how much time we spent in different queries. Right? But I don't think it's gonna show us which threads are active sort of and when. If we disable the like thread collapsing, we could potentially see like, oh, we're spawning ten thousand threads, which would be like a clear indicator of there Probably problem. we won't be doing that, but yeah, I don't know. Just trying to figure out. I guess the question is back up. Who who is going to do this investigation, if anyone? <laughs> and do we have a clear test case that we've decided is like the good one to, to run it on? I feel like I should probably be the one to do this because I'm I keep being the one that brings this up, and the test case there is it's cargo. Like if uh, I was building cargo and it just was way slower than I thought it was going to be, so I can try and do some analysis into this and uh, basically just profile cargo and see what's going on. I wonder if we should. Uh, Intel has this cool tool that I've never actually used successfully. Now I'm on Windows. Maybe I can. Uh, that just for visualizing stuff like this. I forget what it's called. Is that VTune? Yes, VTune. What we really oh, need to do is get someone from Intel to use the tool for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's, super it's like an airpit cockpit kind of tool. But, uh, <laughs> Once upon a time, I was on the VTune team. Oh, uh, see, there we go. <laughs> all right, so it sounds like Josh is going to gather yes, all the numbers and then exactly. disseminate that out to all <laughs> I was sort of angling at that, but hoping you would, you would volunteer that information. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I didn't know, but I had a sense you might be familiar with me. Uh, I don't know, just a thought that it would it would allow us, or I, one of the things it does do is sort of show you, like, here are the threads that are active and when, as I recall. But, there was a, a FOSDEM talk I went to where they were showing, uh, I can't remember the name of the profiler they had, but it, it outputted the Chrome style profiling information, so you could just load it in the browser and and see the thread information stacked on top of each other that way to see what was active and when. Mm, interesting. That's what the um, the, the self-profiler stuff in Rusty basically does exactly that, which is really good for that. We've got that for the um, the, the code gen backend stuff. So like the parallelism we have in LLVM, we have like really nice graphs, so we can kind of really very, very viscerally see what's happening. I just haven't tested it with parallel compilers for everything else yet. Okay, well, I'm game for somebody to investigate more. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna have any time this week, but. Yeah. Um, I can do the, like, ripping out job server, and, like, put up a try build and stuff, uh, and try to take a look myself or hand off the artifacts to Alex. That'd be great. And I can, uh, by the next meeting, I can try to come back with some attempt to have more specifics about what exactly is slow with the job server or what might need to be done with the job server to improve things. Taking all of this into account. So I, I'm avoiding taking, volunteering myself because I'm kind of swamped this week, and I probably will miss next week's meeting also. So, sorry. Good reason. One thing that I also wanted to suggest, I don't know, Alex, you have, I think you said uh, 28 cores, or like virtual cores? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so it might be interesting. Uh, I have 16, I think, which uh, might be interesting to compare the two and see like if we sort of start doing significantly worse as we scale up in terms of core count, might point at something. I don't know what, but yeah, and that's I, I actually do want to learn that as well. Where like if we have a nice sweet spot around eight cores, then we should just 
only give Rusty eight cores and ship this because it'll still be eight x faster than it is today, <laughs> and we can slowly ramp up to six thousand core machines later on. The sweet spot is like two. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, two is better than nothing. I mean, honestly, if you make my compiler fifty percent faster, I will. I'd be very happy about that. Depends what you're doing. Yeah. Cargo check. I'll I don't think you still applies. All right. Cool. Anything else then? Do we do people know what they plan to do? I know what I plan to do. Nothing. It's easy. Well, was anyone in particular assigned to reviewing the session, parse session, or just like general multi-threaded states, see if we can move it to queries or move it out somehow? I am planning to take a look at some of the stuff on session. Um, I think Santiago is going to take a look at print metadata and some of the stuff around there. Who? Uh, Santiago. Yeah. Uh, Mark, also, if you want to, to hand something out from the session, like converting some of the session stuff into queries, like after you do some investigation, just feel free to, to shoot me with something, yeah. Sounds good. I don't think anyone is taking on the syntax walks, but I don't know. I might like throw it at central and see what comes with that. Okay. See if they added it. Good reason. Uh, I guess the bigger question would be, can we actually thread session around with a mute? That would probably be a lot of work. I think the answer is yes, but it requires doing, like, it, we basically need to rip out the, like, uh, interface queries, and I've basically said no to doing that because Oxy has PRs in that area, and I don't want to touch toes. So yeah, and it's probably more, it seems like the, the right first step is take stuff out of session, and then we'll, that may get us far enough. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Later. Thanks. Bye-bye.